Dr. Ethel Tunkelhun, an Associate Professor of Politics at York University. This is Academic Antis. As many of you know, I just spent some time in the UK when I was on sabbatical. I had a really wonderful time and had lots of conversations with friends, old and new. And in these conversations, I was struck by how we shared a lot of the same structural experiences that many of us here in North America have in academia. So today, I want to bring all of you a conversation I had with Dr. Eve Hastikaleff, who I've known for nearly 20 years now, about the state of academia in the UK in a post-Brexit world. Eve is a research fellow at the Institute of Historical Research, the UK's National Center for History, based at the School of Advanced Study at the University of London. As you'll hear in a moment, Eve is a first-gen scholar and she is navigating a system that is full of gatekeepers and that is defined by class hierarchies. In this conversation, you'll hear about her experiences of disenfranchisement in academia, but also hear about the work she's doing to fight the casualization of labor in universities. She'll also talk about the power of finding those who will have your back when the system is stacked against you. Have a listen. So Eve, um, can you talk to us a little bit about your academic journey? Um, And I guess, you know, I know a little bit about your story, but one thing I wanted to ask was, was doing a PhD always something in your sidelines? How did you come to doing your PhD? What was your academic journey like? Thank you for that question. Um, I didn't know. I had absolutely no idea or understanding of what a PhD was whatsoever. And I probably hadn't even heard of the term until I would say my late 20s. Oh. Um, so I really, it really wasn't something that was ever on my radar because, um, you know, even though I did an undergraduate degree in the UK, um, how that, you know, degree was structured and then kind of the opportunities that were available for that um, were never really explained so I think that was one of the biggest shocks when I when I was at university was just trying to understand what the hell was going on. Mm. Like, you know, who who what a lecturer was and what they did and what a researcher was and just really not having really any insight <laughs> into that world whatsoever. Um so it was only years and years after um my undergraduate degree that I started looking at doing a master's okay. because I'd been living abroad for, for for a number of years so again it's kind of that typical story you know about having a background um being a first gen student so so coming as someone from uh my well my dad went to a technical college but no one in my family had ever been to university or finished school um and I was the only one in my family that did a levels and also growing up with quite a complex family background that I won't go into too much. But, you know, my dad died when I was at a young age and mm. my mom had a number of serious mental health issues um, that really meant that there was a lot of instability in my formative years. Mm-hmm. Um, and also I didn't have that person apart from, mm. you know, that, you know, the the that one or two teachers that you always remember right from high school. Right. Who kind of ever sat me down and said, you're quite bright or you're quite good at this. So actually, you know, you could, you could, if you put your mind to it, you could, you could do this. So university in my head wasn't something that I really understood what it was. And I remember when I was at sixth form college, I remember, um, I think it was one of my teachers who sat down and helped me fill the forms out because this was back in the day where you had to fill the forms out. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really understand what I was applying for, right? All of the um, people I knew, they were going off to open days with their parents. Mm. And so they were traveling around the country, going to different places. I literally, I mean, picked some names out of a hat, you could say, (laughs) and just... um, And I remember I went to two open days. I think one was in Liverpool and one was in Nottingham, but I went on my own Mm. because I didn't know that the whole structure of university, particularly in the UK, is, um, and for undergraduate students, is the assumption that you have a supportive family network. Right. um, And that you have this kind of background support whereby, you know, these things are explained to you. I didn't have that. I didn't have that support. Everything that you point to uh, speaks to how some people who have had parents who've gone to university understand the system. Um, I know that uh, some, like I remember one of my classmates in undergrad, like her, his dad actually knew some of the other professors in the department and would kind of, and when the class was full, uh, he actually like called up... (laughs) 
his friend Mm -hmm. who was teaching the class and was like, can you not, you know, give, you know, my son a spot? And so there are like these, these like knowledges that are passed down that, as you mentioned, first generation students such as yourself really don't know, right? And so you've had to learn through osmosis, right? So that I think is really interesting, even with the open days, right? Like people would come with your parents, you went by yourself, right? Um, and so I if think- I, I, If I went at all, yeah. And some some of them I didn't even go to, but, um, and that makes me very sad as well, because it reminds me of when I was, um, so I was at secondary school and we had, you know, teacher, teacher parent evenings, as we call them, and going on my own to those as oh, well. Really? And that fills me with a lot of sadness, really. But, you know- um, but th- these are the experiences that people have. And that was my reality at that time. Right. Um, so I went to university in 2000 and it was a time when we had scholarships, right? Mm. We had free uni or fees mm. were just being introduced as well. Um, and there were funding, there were different funding opportunities. So I remember that when I was at secondary school, I um, secured, I, it, we did we did a residential week, I think, for my A-levels. So um, that was an award that I got that was able to go. And incredibly, I also got, um, got a scholarship to go and study in Argentina for a year. So oh. I went to high school in Argentina. Right. Um, and these opportunities were just unbelievable. They absolutely opened my mind to, like, to all the opportunities there were, everything that, you know, the world could be. Um, and it was quite, a, what saddens me now is to know that, you know, many of those opportunities have just simply gone. And I think that if you'd asked a 19-year-old Eve to her if she would um, go to university, the answer would be no. Right. Because, because it was precisely because of these insurmountable hurdles, right, obstacles that... Um, that there's just no way that if you said, oh, what, I'd come out with £30,000 worth of debt and that doesn't even include, like, you know, the accommodation and food and everything. No way, no way. So, Absolutely. Yeah, it does sadden me that the sector is gradually, has gradually been chipping away at it, not just um, not just the university sector, but actually the broader kind of opportunities that are available to students now, as well as, like, post-Brexit, for example. So the Erasmus scheme that we had that, that meant that I could go and study during my degree in France and Germany and meant that I was given a stipend. Um, and, you know, those relationships that were built, that I'm still in touch with those people that, you know, you might have met a couple of them at my wedding (laughs) many years ago Ethel but um it's all those things that you feel are disappearing really and what's giving way to that is just a sector just that's just available to the privileged or the very 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 few who are actually lucky to to secure something but these are such good observations because in your lifetime you could already see the differences uh when Mm -hmm. you were going into uni there were all of these funding schemes available these exchange schemes available uh the uk was still part of the eu and now through years and years and years of austerity and cutbacks, you can already see how this is impacting students who would, without these supports, would not be able to go to university like you did, right? And this is horrendous. Yeah, and it's not just that. It's also, it's affecting the way they think about education. And that is the bit that saddens me the most because um, I'm very, I see myself as very fortunate in the fact that I was able to, you know, I was given that I was able to do a year abroad and I was able to, um, you know, lose myself a little in my 20s and not really be sure about what I wanted to do with my career or whether I had a career. Um, And people are finding that, you know, young people are really not even being given the opportunity to, Mm. you know, mess up anymore, right? Right. It's so that they're basically on this conveyor belt. So recently our Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, announced that he wants to reintroduce um, the teaching of mathematics until people are 18. Um, which might sound like a good idea, but a but the the biggest uh, problem there being that there are no teachers no. <laughs> because the teachers are being paid so appallingly and being treated so badly that you know nobody wants to work in the sector anymore. So um, it's just that it saddens me because when you speak to students, it's not about the joy of learning, mm. right? It's about what do I need? What tick box do I need? What um, grade do I need um, to get me onto this next level to keep me going up this, this, this scale? Not, you know, I want to sit and uh, I want to, you know, have a love of literature or learn about, um, learn about the world or question the world as well, you know, and, and be exposed to maybe ways of thinking or ways of um, people, ways of existing that I don't understand and um, that I want to learn more about. And I find that very, very worrying. 
I guess I kind of wanted to talk about the PhD journey that you've been on and how, you know, you talked, you know, quite passionately about how, you know, through your your your, your undergraduate studies, you were able to kind of, you know, like read and pursue your love for languages, right? Um, and clearly it's this love for learning that has gotten you through. Was mm -hmm. your PhD journey similar? What was your PhD journey like? Did it kind of instill further a love for research or was it was it more challenging in that it was harder to navigate some of these some of these structural barriers as you know Ethel you and I met in um, when I was working in the Dominican Republic and I'd been there for for a number of years and when I was there I did I had the opportunity to do a postgraduate course um, and I had I had been saying for years, oh, my God, uh, there's no way I would ever go back to university. There's no way I would, um, you know, put myself through that again, because really my memories of my undergrad were not there weren't great ones. I met some great people and I made some lasting friendships and there were some positives to take away from that. But really that whole experience of being overwhelmed in an institution that kind of felt like this big being in the belly of the beast basically mm. that didn't love you back and mm. didn't really support you I found that I found that very very difficult um so I did a, a postgraduate diploma did really well in it and just really just enjoyed it enjoyed kind of the the thinking about these ideas and um and the challenge of kind of carrying that research project um I then uh, saw there was a, mas a master's I wanted to do in the UK. And again, I did this master's. It took me seven years to save up to do the master's mm. degree in central London, you know, mm. very expensive place. And what I never realised was I didn't even know there were bursaries available. <gasps> I just, really? I had, no I had no idea. No, oh. I didn't. I, I had no idea. So I started the course having paid several thousand pounds for, for the course. But I had no idea that the institution would support you or that you could get funding for anything like that. That was just not something I, I knew was, was a possibility. Mm. And then I did this master's and, again, really, really got into it. But it took me years then from get, from getting that master's to reaching the PhD point. Well, I would say how many years? Ten? Sorry, um, not ten. Five years, maybe four or five years. It took me to actually get to the point of the PhD. And I remember seeing um, uh, well, one of uh, the old um, uh, members of staff there who said to me, I remember at a, a conference and saying, "Oh, why didn't you do a PhD with us?" And I just looked at her and thought. But that would entail being in central London for four years with no income, mm. you know, paying astronomical rents. Mm. Like that wasn't even on my radar. <laughs> so, of course, I never did. And, um, you know, I would have liked to stay. So it's the way that because money and finan financial issues underpin, like that's the first question that you go to if you don't have any any kind of way of managing these things so and that then that governs every single decision you make mm. um so that my financial situation meant that by the time I applied to do a PhD um so I applied for a number of programs I missed out by one place so I applied for one uh, Edinburgh I remember having an interview and just missing out for that place mm. and feeling absolutely you know heartbroken thinking there's no way I could ever pursue this and then an opportunity appeared in in Aberdeen so I ended up um, doing a PhD there for, and I'm going to say this, £300 stipend a month. What? <laughs> so so I got £3,600 a year to do this PhD and they covered my fees, but that was all I got to live That's on. That's ridiculous. Um, it's beyond ridiculous. Um, oh my God. And, yeah, that, and despite my protests and my uh, being quite vocal about how ridiculous this situation was, um, that program is still going <laughs> and they're still um they're they're now uh they've increased it slightly but really it's nowhere near even the minimal no any, yeah so i mean but you, but this is but for me the way this was sold to me was you're very lucky to be here you're very lucky mm. it was all about this idea that i should be fortunate i should be grateful basically for this opportunity because how fortunate i am that i'm getting my fees covered and how fortunate i am that i've been accepted onto a program and it's always that imposter syndrome thing that you have in the background right thinking that you're not good enough or you don't fit the criteria or you're not clever enough now i know it's complete nonsense because I think when you've been to, in the UK, I think when you've been to a boarding school or a private school or an elite kind of, um, and this is what I'm trying to kind of get to your your listeners about how big the kind of these uh, class divides are mm. in the UK. And I think maybe many of you listeners who might have um, even studied in the UK will be much more kind of familiar with this. But it is very shocking 
that, you know, if you're from from kind of a privileged institution, the assumption is you will always go to a, an elite school. And I'm mm. sure that happens in, in the US and, the, and Canada all the time. Um, but uh, and I found that fascinating. Um, I know there was a recent research study that that said that basically that the people who were privileged, just it was an assumption. It was always their right to, to be there, whereas I always had a voice in my head telling me I wasn't good enough, I wasn't intelligent enough, I wasn't worthy enough. Um, and it's taken many years to actually, yeah, to address we, that, I think. Can we can we unpack that a little bit? So I'm trying to imagine what's it, what, what it's like to kind of pursue your PhD, but also at the back of your head kind of seeing, you know, people around you um, succeed in academia and recognizing that those who are succeeding, if I'm kind of understanding you correctly, are those who belong to a certain class hierarchy or those who are kind of more privileged. You know, I think it's talking about questions of intersectionality and also recognizing that how, uh, yeah, privilege and, and, yeah, and how kind of the higher education system is structured disenfranchises all different groups of people. So at the moment, um, the UK is um, trying to address casualisation in in the sector. So it knows that precarious contracts are just prevalent now in the system as they are, you know, um, uh, in many other countries. I know in Germany as well, they have the Ich bin Hannah um, Mm -hmm. campaign as well, which is talking about this. But you've kind of got this toxic mix then of um, traditionally disenfranchised groups who are not being supported enough by institutions, whose voices are being marginalised and not being listened to. But you also have this this epidemic really of... um, of of widespread casualization, which obviously means that you know if mommy and daddy are going to pay for you <laughs> to um to go to a conference, an international conference, or they're going to, or it doesn't matter really if you don't get the no- next contract because you can afford to not work for six months, then that creates very different tiers of people, right? Whereas for somebody like um yeah, uh well I I mean in my case. Um, you know, I worked until nine months pregnant. Mm-hmm. I um, and this was as a, a single mom as well, without a partner. So I worked until nine months pregnant. I came back after three months, specifically because I knew that my contract was ending. And um, you know, out of that panic, that panic of I need to keep working, I must keep going. My contract's going to end. I actually shot myself in the foot because it meant that my maternity protections ended, and the university made me redundant anyway. Oh my right? god! Whereas if I'd stayed on maternity, and if I got the right advice and the right support and kind of somebody had said you know calm down um then I might have been in a very different situation so it really does feel like the that it's just such an unloving place right whereby you might meet individuals who are caring and kind but the the kind of structural um levels the kind of microaggressions that people from all different um warps of life um uh experience every single day are just can be just horrifying um which is why i think it's important that people people tell their story and people kind of make are more vocal about this just getting back to the point i was making about casualization so um there've been a whole array of efforts in the uk to kind of address this so at the institutional level um we've had you know you might have workshops so and I, it always makes me laugh when <laughs> you know you get an email about hey why don't you come and do um you know are you feeling depressed and down why don't you do do our well-being <laughs> course or desk yoga you know oh my god yes or, um uh you know all of those ridiculous kind of suggestions or come and have some tea and cake those oh are my the god. And that, that's, you know, and that's the kind of tick box mentality that universities kind of implement to say, oh, we're addressing the issue of, you know, chronic casualization. We're, we're addressing the issue of um, our early career researchers going to food banks and not being able to feed themselves or PhD researchers as well, you know. But when, you know, when I'm in a classroom and I'm thinking I can't actually afford my rent this month, you know, but then being responsible for I don't know how many students, it's 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 wrong. It is at it, I, I don't know it makes my blood boil but so that's some um, kind of the, the the kind of silly kind of um uh yeah trying to put a plaster over a i don't know So, I mean, I know that you've been involved with, based on kind of me watching your Twitter feed and me kind of watching the interviews you've given, you've been involved and have been kind of one of the 
leaders in kind of highlighting the perils of casualization in higher education in the UK. Can you speak well, more? Friend, thank you. Yeah, I really thank think you that. For that. No, yeah. I mean, I don't want to, I, no, I don't want to put myself a, a, across this. I just moan a lot on Twitter. <laughs> no, 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 no. But I think but, honestly. But I have been part of, so for example, yeah. so there's um, at a, at a UK wide level. Um, so I've been quite um, active in the, the British Academy, for example, they've created an early career network. Um, and I was quite active in that at the beginning. And this was at a time when I was redundant, right? Mm. When I had a young baby and I was redundant. And I was thinking, my God, what? future do I have in this kind of situation so it was this um ridiculous situation really where you know you're being asked to kind of to help support um workshops and talk about casualization in the sector and I'm literally sat there with a babe in arms you know looking at university kind of people quite senior in the university um and you're just thinking yeah there's something wrong here so and what I what fascinates me about um I'm not talking specifically about about the that network because there are a number of networks now that we're seeing popping up but what we see what we see with that is how then um that precarity right or the, those kind of uh, uh, disadvantages are reproduced anyway within that kind of system so what you're saying is we want to fight precarity in the system but then we're going to invite all the people but the people who can attend are the people who don't have caring responsibilities exactly and can afford to train and can even though there are some, I see efforts where, you know, they're trying to cover their expenses or that there are efforts trying to address it, but really they're missing the point, which is I don't really want to be sat listening to, for example, if we have a, a career advancement seminar, mm. I don't really, I'm 42 years old. I don't really want to sit and be listening to like, you know, an old senior academic, usually a, typically a, a white guy telling me how easy it was when he did his PhD when he was 22, you know, and how we should all just be like bettering ourselves. And it's, it's a bettering back, yourself. Oh no, but it's getting, it, that's it. It's getting back to the point that the, so if you don't, if the institutions refuse to see this as a structural issue and the whole solution that's being proposed to the people who are suffering within the system is either leave and get um, an industry job or, um, oh, it's just about getting that next publication or it's about getting that next funding bid in or it's about getting that next award. And that's a lie. And that's the bit that really is making me, I don't want to say a bitter individual, but really I've hit every every achievement, everything I was told to do that would further me along in my career, I have done and I've done um, at a level of excellence, mm -hmm. right? And still, I'm precariously unemployed as a 42-year-old um, with a contract that's ending in January with a young toddler in tow. Um, I haven't. I don't think I've got one one interview actually this year at all. There's something. There's, there's something wrong with the system. There's we something need to wrong with the system. Honest, right? Yeah. We need to stop being honest and saying so. To kind of sit in those, you know, workshops and and be told, oh, like we're we're going to help you. Uh, enhance your I don't know maybe you're lacking skills in this sector set area maybe you're lacking skills in that and it gets to the point where you're like do you know what <laughs> there's only so much self-improvement you can do until you you have to you know the bills need to be paid somebody needs to be, be absolutely um, cash. and then so that was the university level the nationwide level kind of the different um, activities that take in place and how I can see that again you know the people who it most should be targeting and kind of helping are the ones who are being left behind again because they're the ones that actually you know because when you're asking people you're saying well can you give this keynote can you give this lecture that's labor that's labor <laughs> so you're asking precarity employed people to offer more of their labor and then still not get paid for it but then you know sell that to them as an opportunity there's only so many opportunities aren't there i think that people can sensibly take on without you know um without without this just becoming a bit farcical which i think we're at that level and then finally so i just wanted to say about the ucu so yep. our, our um our union as well so again you know, um, casualization is kind of, we feel as casualized workers, we're always the first to be thrown under the bus, mm. right? So we're always told, yeah, the union's there for you. We're definitely on board with it. Like casualization is destroying the sector. But actually at the level of any form of negotiation, it's always about the, you know, the more senior academics. Mm. So talk about, and not saying these issues aren't completely important, which they are, you know, to talk about pensions, to talk about all sorts of um 
workers' rights within the sector. But, you know, when you're literally now in a situation where you're sat at a table um, in your department, you know, with people who can pay their bills, right, and can feed their, can 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 feed themselves and can go off to all these conferences and can do all of, you know, have, have all this mobility, and they're literally sat at tables with people who are going to food banks, there's something really wrong going on. All we're hearing from this side of the pond is, well, there's a lot of strikes um, in support of, you know, better higher education in the UK. Uh, what's going on in the UK context that's leading people to actually mobilize or try to mobilize and try to kind of, you know, get get policymakers to listen? Like, what are some of the concrete demands? And yet you also say, as a side note, that some of the demands that get kind of put at the very top are the demands of people who are already in more stable situations, right? So, you know, can you speak a little bit more of that dynamic too? Well, in the UK, we have an absolute cost of living crisis. Um, So, you know, post-Brexit as well. Um, But, you know, the cost of living is absolutely just reached sky high limits um you know just just so as april's come around so um you know everything's gone up from food to rent to mortgage to any any you know uh, fuel all sorts of um day-to-day payments transport as Mm. well so all of these things are obviously having an impact on people in a sector where actually real life um earning um has gone down right Mm. It's it's not increased, it's not improved, it's actually gone down. And when you we're in a situation where we've got doctors striking, yes. you know, um, doctors who are being paid less, well, or the, the, the campaign is being criticised for kind of um, focusing on this, but, you know, where, where doctors are complaining because they're being paid less than baristas, right? Yeah. Then they're, they're, there's, there's something really seriously going wrong. And I think for me, it feels like, you know, maybe I'm being a bit naive, but it just feels like there are a lot of broken promises, right, within that whole system. So you're sold, um, particularly if you're a, if you're a, uh, from the UK, you're sold this idea that the UK is a meritocracy. Mm-hmm. And when you get to the, um, when you get to the um, level of university and you realise it isn't because for me it was always but when I get my master's and mm. then when I get my PhD and then when I get my post first post or when I get my second post and now I'm like five years out of the PhD you're thinking this ain't working no. <laughs> right um and that that's that's what's so concerning about as I said not just the UK in general but the situation we're seeing globally if we're commercializing education so much to the point where we're uh, you know the amount of humanities departments, history departments in particular, philosophy departments, languages departments, lots of different and very important areas where they might not bring in a lot of income for the university, but actually they're fundamental. Like how can you how can you close down a history department for the? It's just Ridiculous. it's just heartbreaking. It's absolutely heartbreaking. And then you're replacing it with what um, business courses or finance courses or um, you know. Um, yeah, of course, is that basically are bringing, bringing in an income and then uh, lecturers who are being punished because they have low attendance on their courses. It seems like the value of education as being a good in itself, it seems as though that's just kind of people have just abandoned that. Right. And even some of the structures that you've talked about, right, like in terms of kind of putting value solely in terms of bumps on seats, how many students are enrolled, are they satisfied with your class, how many research grants you bring in, how much these research grants are. I mean, that also creates a hierarchy between disciplines too, right? Because Mm -hmm. some research projects, um, you know, merit more funding versus others, right? And again, even funding bodies are also are also part of this kind of austerity, uh, you know, mindset, right? Where it's like mm-hmm. research that... And com- yeah. colonial mindset yes. as well, right? So where you have white scholars who are then c- coming in and completely dominating because the whole system's structured on this idea that you've got somebody higher than you that's going to lift you up. Mm. And if those people are pushing you down or they're not supporting you, and we see this all the time, you know, with the decolonization discourse of white scholars coming in and kind of drowning out the voices of of black scholars. Um, and also just kind of, yeah, just a form of colonization, right? In a form of just taking over um, certain areas of thought. Um and closing the door. So we've got a lot of gatekeepers in academia and a lot of people that... And that was for me, because of what I didn't know, which is apparently or seemingly obvious to people who understand the system is, again, my my decision to do my PhD was financial, not based upon who was giving me supervision. And this is not to say anything against my PhD supervisors, but 
if you're not um, in the right space and you don't have a PhD supervisor who's going to push you forward in their field and take you to those conferences and encourage you to participate on those panels and help you get published, um, then that is a huge um, yeah, huge, huge disadvantage. And that is something I simply didn't understand at all. I, I just wanted to do a PhD and I had a, I, what I thought and still think was a great idea for a project and wanted, you know, would go anywhere to see that being supported. For sure. Um, but, but again, talking about that structural inequality, how it's just built on the system of either pe the people who let you through the gates and the people who are kind of closing up the fortress and not letting any of them in. And, and that is a, uh, yeah, that 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 is to the detriment, really, of um, supporting, you know, new research, exciting research. Absolutely. And I feel like, you know, going back to your PhD story, it was like it was being sold as a benefit to you when you're actually like in hindsight, you're like, actually, you completely screwed me over. No one can survive on yeah. 300 pounds. This is not a benefit to me. No, I, I mean, it's really not funny, even when I think about it now. And this is why I've spoken to you about this, Ethel, but talking about my kind of experience from PhD onwards as a trauma, because I am traumatized that I was mm. working, you know, it, essentially it led to the part of it led to the, you know, the breakdown of my marriage. I was working three jobs. I was getting up at four in the morning to mark papers because I was told I had to, you know, and because it was very much, you felt you thought that was what you had to do because you thought that got you ahead right but yeah. all actually when you say yes to things like that what it's really doing is putting you further and down further down the pecking order and leaving you at more of a disadvantage right because you're doing all the groundwork and all the um the invisibilized labor for the institution itself and then not really getting any of the recognition or any of the support to to move forward so I think 300 pounds a month is obscene it's obscene um, and, yeah and the point that I wanted to say was so I was sat with somebody um with a, a junior academic a lot younger than me who said you know and this is I'm thinking I've been working with these people for four years and I um during that time so as you know Ethel I had um I was living with an abusive partner during Covid I then escaped my abusive partner at seven months pregnant I was uh, effectively didn't tell anybody at work, continued working until nine months pregnant, had an extremely traumatic labour in which I hemorrhaged, um, had postpartum sepsis, among other complications, and almost died, was rushed to intensive care, and then spent 10 days on a, on a maternity ward, not being allowed to have any visitors because mm -hmm. of COVID. Um, it was a deeply traumatic time. And then I spent basically six months alone with my newborn child um, because of all the COVID restrictions. Um, and in the meantime, I lost my job. <laughs> I was made redundant. I had to move house. I had to leave the city I was working in and um, kind of really start again. It was really deeply, deeply traumatic time in my life. And one of which I don't I feel I was failed by my by by my employer I feel that I was failed by the government really because of all the crisis that was going on I feel that that I think that the hospital staff were absolutely unbelievable and the pressure they were under but um the fact that you know the people that I was on the women I was on the ward with were not allowed to see anybody or their partners was deeply distressing anyway that aside when I was actually when when my baby was I think six months old I went to um I had to remove my books from from the office of where I was working and to say also another strategy that they use at UK universities is if you're precariously employed specifically if you're a postdoc they often don't give you a desk to work from so the institutions decide that you don't have a physical presence at the university and they sell this to you as being oh it's so you know oh it's flexible for you and it means you can work from home and it's fine but really what they're saying is actually if you're visible and people see you coming in and out every day they know you work there and they, mm. they associate you with being a member of staff mm. um, so I had to fight, I had to really fight to, to get visibility and get an office that I shared with um, with another colleague, um, which I, in the end I hardly ever, if ever, used because COVID struck and then it yeah. was just left empty. Um, so when I went and got my, you know, books and cleaned the, cleared my things off the bookshelf, I kid you not, and this was in one of their multi-million pound buildings that they had just built, right? So this was an empty building worth millions of pounds that was just kind of there, but not being used, obviously. Um, and then I had to roll my books and my newborn baby, right? Past, oh a breast, past their brand new breastfeeding suite. Oh my that God. That they had installed in the building. And I can't, I just broke down in tears. I was oh, like, this yeah. situation is beyond ridiculous. Like, yeah. you know, because it's kind of, the institutions are just 
outwardly kind of spinning this discourse of how inclusionary they are and how great they are. But I'm like, I'm literally a member of staff who was who never got to use that breastfeeding suite that you This told makes me, me so me, right? livid because the rhetoric will then be, look at us, we have a breastfeeding suite, we are supportive exactly. of mothers, right? Um, look at us being responsive to gender equity concerns, right? And you're like, yeah, it's all nonsense. Yeah, but it's you all sack me. Right. After I had the baby. Right. And so mm-hmm. kind of the optics of you rolling, I can kind of see you rolling your your pram along with like. But it wasn't just cost. it wasn't just it made me redundant as well. It was I was being told. So I applied for a position through redeployment and I was being told, oh, but you're not qualified enough. Right. <gasps> so it's again that thing of being told that you're not. And it's complete. I, I'm not going to get into that because we disagreed on that. We disagreed on the fact that I was I was qualified for a job. They disagreed with it. But again, it's that the whole battle that you feel you face an institution where you're saying, I mean, what more do you want from me? Because, mm. um, you know, you have this whole list of achievements and accolades and you're still being told when it's convenient to them because, that you know, they obviously didn't want me for that post that I it wasn't enough the feeling that that gave me of inadequacy and failure right so being a finding myself suddenly unexpectedly um finding myself as a single mom thrown into the situation during covid with a young baby and then being told yeah having no income right and then having been having to move the city that I was based in and trying to build a home in I mean it was it was yeah, traumatic. So this is why, I mean, uh, traumatic is not the word. And But again, I know many of us have stories like this. Many of us have had horrendous experiences. The point, going back to the guy that I was um, sat with, this younger academic guy who does have a permanent job, right, is a lot younger than me, is in stable employment, went to Oxbridge, by the way. Mm. Um, he said, wasn't COVID great? Oh, my. <laughs> and I remember sitting there thinking, God, so over the few years I've known him, <laughs> you know, over the few years I've known him, I've gone from, uh, you know, moving, having all these precarious employment um, uh, things happening, having a horrendous time at work, having a baby, almost dying, then bringing up a child, then moving cities, doing all of this. And sorry, sorry what, what, why was COVID great? You know, and he said, oh, it just gave me some really great downtime. And oh. it meant that, you know, I was just really able to unwind. And didn't you find, and I just, I honestly thought I am sitting around the table with people who have no comprehension whatsoever of my lived experience. They have no compassion or understanding um, that there are colleagues and maybe students as well, you know, students or colleagues or people they come across on the day to day or the people on campus, right? People who are serving them coffee, for God's sake, who have had these absolutely heart wrenching tragedies happen to them. And you have no clue. And that was that that really struck home for me, really did, because I, I just I just yeah my my um yeah my heart kind of sank at that point I just thought what what's the point (laughs) yeah no it's like your your experiences your your worlds are so apart that you're like how would you even how can you even say that right I'm just shaking my head uh we're running out of time but I do have one last question if I can sneak it in if that's okay what can we do to shift existing conditions I mean this system is broken it is untenable what would you suggest our listeners do Right. Listen, I'm going to I do did want to end on a positive note as well, because there are positives to take away from this the, um, this comedy of errors. But um, uh, so one example would be that I when I uh, yeah had just had just at the time that I was pregnant and had my baby, I, I secured a fellowship. Mm. And this was it was an early career fellowship, but it was to support um, it was to support early career researchers. Um, and it was just working with supportive people Mm. who were kind Mm. right um that I found just I I found it actually incredibly emotional because realizing that some people do have you back in the system some people do want you to do well some people are in your corner um and that for me was um was really really um I I needed that it was really necessary because I was really on my way out by that point um so so I think it's finding those opportunities those moments of happiness right Mm -hmm. but also finding people who are going to love you back really and be that if that's a a supportive PhD supervisor for example or a supportive partner right when you go through your PhD or um somebody somebody in in the institution uh, administrative staff right are going to help you just process your finance uh, payments and are going to kind of understand when you've got issues with that so it's finding people 
um, you know, the humanity kind of within that system. And where I am now as well, um, I, I absolutely love where I am. So I work at the Institute of Historical Research um, with a great bunch of people. Never, never thought in a million years I'd be working with a, a group of medievalists. Um, but actually... You know, when you're working with people who are kind and who are supportive and are, um, yeah, and are just really that want to learn and kind of have a love of learning, um, it makes the world a difference. The, the, the only issue, of course, is, again, I'm on another fixed term contract. My contract's ending in January and um, it's just trying to find that next opportunity that's the bit that I always find in the last six months of a job absolutely exhausting yeah. and I, I say this because I was on six month contracts for two and a half years mm. so every six months I had to um you know I was on these rolling contracts so that that's the bit that there is a positive bit to it but the exhausting bit really is the institution is the way that the things that, uh, that these systems are set up and the way the institutions are set up that they need to give people jobs mm. <laughs> and they need to acknowledge who are their who are their best and their brightest within the system and um and kind of you know take people like that under their wing and adopt them and ensure that people and that does happen it does happen in certain environments but it certainly didn't happen in my experience um and i think when you work in interdisciplinary research particularly as i said interdisciplinary research and emerging research you can get lost between the cracks i think and i think that says a lot about um, how traditional uk kind of institutional structures are as well if you don't sit within a home mm -hmm. because you know, so in my case it was is it politics is it law is it latin american history what is it um then you can kind of find that it's actually quite difficult to move move in those spaces when on the flip side it's actually those very that skill set and and that um approach to learning and to research that should be you know pushing your career sky high um so it's about yeah about thinking about these things in a bit more nuanced way and yeah being there for each other that's excellent. Fantastic words to end on. And I really, I'll put in the link for your book, for people to buy your book, which, you know, I'm so excited about legal identity, race and belonging in the Dominican Republic from Citizens can of Foreigner. Can I Warner. just say, yeah. can I just say that this weekend it reached number one in Latin American sales for Amazon. Woohoo! So number one in, best, in the bestseller list. So That's yeah, amazing. Yeah. I'm so proud of you. And Eve, if there are people who want to follow you on Twitter, do you want to share your handle? Yeah, my handle's at E Hayes D Calaf. So that's E H A Y E S D E K A L A F. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that's Academic Andes. There's a lot that stands out to me from my conversation with Eve. And there's a lot that's also profoundly familiar to me despite being an ocean away. Whether it's cultures of backlash, processes of casualization, structured austerity, or the normalization of a real cruelty that exists in academia, we need to be watching what is happening in the UK in the post-Brexit period. Because what's happening there is going to happen here. It's going to happen to wherever you are, if it hasn't already. We're going to be talking more about the systemic inequities in higher education in the UK in the weeks ahead, so watch out for that. What I take from Eve too is the importance of remembering that not everyone has the same start in life and that persisting inequities wrought by class, including through intergenerational wealth and privilege and sexism, make it a bigger challenge for some to get a foothold in academia. Rather than seeing academia as a calling, an idea that serves to justify abysmal working conditions, we should instead look at the conditions of work that characterize the sector and fight for change. So what do you think? Get in touch with us on Twitter at, at @academicanti. On Mastodon, you can find us at academicantis at mass.to. And send us an email anytime at podcast at academicantis.com. Remember to rate and review us on your favorite podcast app. And find out all the ways you can support the podcast by visiting academicantis.com slash support. This includes becoming a Patreon supporter, which helps us cover our production costs. Thank you to all of our patrons. We really appreciate your support. Today's episode of Academic Antis was hosted by me, Dr. Ethel Tungohan, and produced by myself, Dr. Nisha Nath, and Wayne Chu. Tune in next time when we talk to more Academic Antis. Until then, take care, be 
be kind to yourself and don't be an asshole. 